Great. It is uh, Wednesday, September 22nd, and I welcome everyone to the monthly meeting of the Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority. As I mentioned, Kathy's not going to be here. We're still hoping Carla will arrive. Uh, we're changing up the meeting order, as you can see from the agenda. Uh, Dan has a hard stop at five o'clock. Um, so he asked that he be put on the agenda first, which we were happy to accommodate. Um, and so we know that you may disappear at some time. We can see you now, but if, when you have to go, you can just sign off, that would be great. And uh, I know there are many issues you're gonna talk about. I think the uh, first one and the one that uh, you'll likely spend the most time on are the refinancing scenarios. And I wanted to just ask you before you started, um, were you able to reconcile with the controller the issues that you had with their set of numbers that they uh, shared in the beginning of July, I believe? Uh, I, I had a conversation with uh, the controller and the deputy controller. And, uh, I have an understanding of what's behind all their numbers. Um, yes. So it was more just clarification uh, as to what they were saying, not an identified issue. With well, them. I identified an issue. I mean, it, uh, it, 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 they were using uh, uh, AMBAC fund, uh, AMBAC's forbearance liability balance that was a year old at one point, makes six million dollars lower than it actually is as of this time next year, and that's what they were running their entire analysis on, which didn't only skew what would be left over if you used fund balance to pay it off, but it also skewed comparison schedules uh, to uh, alternative debt repayment plans. Um, and, 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 you know, we discussed that. I, I was a little bit surprised here in the council meeting last week that, um, you know, we didn't discuss it or it wasn't clear or something like that. Um, but yeah, we, did, we definitely discussed that and we had um, some other discussions about methodology, including present value as well. And I'll turn it over to you. I think you've explored or you're sharing many options tonight. Well, in uh, many scenarios, but um, let me share my screen and you can move forward. Right. Trying to do this and also see my notes at the same time. I don't know if I can do that. I, I will tell you it's so small that almost no one can see it, but if it helps to keep the side notes up. Um, it, it actually it actually does, so I can read off my notes here. Um, so. All right, well, um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide some commentary on the city's debt repayment plans. Uh, they're, they're, as you alluded to, there's been um, increased discussion lately and a different strategy than what's in the five-year plan um, is at the center of that. So I wanted to offer this analysis. Um, you know, as a first step, and this is probably a uh, review for everyone, um, want to review you know, some of the city's key debt components. Um, like I said, it's review, but the, I'll, you know, where the conversation logically starts. Uh, in 1997, the city issued uh, general obligation bonds that mature in 2002, next year. So after next year, they'll be all gone, which is good news. Um, the bonds are insured by AMBAC Corporation. Uh, and AMBAC, as we all know, had to step uh, in back in 2012 to make principal and interest payments on the bonds when uh, the city was not able to. Um, because uh, AMBAC was uh, forced to do that, the city incurred a forbearance debt from those payments that is now um, up to about $26.2 million and accrues in interest at a rate of 6.75%. Um, that's a high rate. Uh, the city also provides a general obligation guarantee on the Harrisburg Redevelopment Authority Series 2005 bonds, which uh, we often refer to as 
um, the stadium funds. Now the revenue, there's a revenue stream that is dedicated uh, to repay that debt service, but it's always insufficient to meet the entire annual obligation. So the city needs to perform on this obligation uh, every year. And of course, since there's a debt obligation associated with um, uh, these bonds uh, or with this revenue stream, that revenue stream can't be used for other city purposes. Um, these bonds are also insured by AMAC and they mature in 2030. There'll be uh, about $5.8 million in total principal and interest payments remaining on the bonds after the next debt service payment um, is made on November 15th. Um, if you recall, the city and uh, AMBAC were engaged in extensive uh, negotiations regarding these uh, liabilities. Uh, the two parties reached an agreement where AMBAC agrees to give the city discounts uh, on the outstanding principal uh, on the forbearance liability, as well as temporary interest rate reductions on that very high 6.75% uh, on the li liability in exchange for the city agreeing to defease or pay off the stadium bonds. And as a term of the agreement, the, the defeasance has to be executed by December 31st of this year. The agreement also provides additional discounts in the forbearance liability on city prepayments up to $4 million. Those prepayments also need to be made by December 31st. The December 30, uh, December 31st deadline is the term of the agreement. Maximizing the benefits of this agreement, that is defeasing the stadium bonds and also prepaying at least $4 million towards the forbearance debt will uh, result in $3.3 million of immediate reductions to that forbearance liability. In addition, the like I mentioned, the interest rate on the forbearance debt will be reduced temporarily for a period of three years from 6.75% to, to 5%. So a, a significant reduction. After these prepayments are made, the city would have the option, but not the obligation to refinance the remaining forbearance uh, balance or pay down uh, with cash or leave it outstanding if, if it chooses. There, there are no restrictions or um, um, conditions at that point. There is an alternative strategy or plan that's been discussed that suggests that the city leave the stadium bonds outstanding, forego the benefits of the agreement, and instead repay the forbearance debt with cash over some period of time, whether it's one year or two years, three years, it's not quite defined, but uh, he, you know, focus their cash on that. Uh, we, we've modeled several scenarios on different repayment strategies, frequencies. It's clearly you know, many permutations, but we think we bookended it pretty well. Uh, that show that the strategy would deplete the city's existing fund balance well below the target level outlined in the five-year plan. And that target level is uh, about two months of um, operating expenses or about $11.9 million. And also fail to maintain reserves sufficient to meet other capital needs. The projections also show a negative fund balance in some years, which is obviously inconsistent with the goals of the five, five year plan. And short of new funding sources or uh, budget cuts, it is just plainly infeasible. But in addition to all that, the strategy is more expensive than any other um, scenario that we modeled out. Uh, with the AMBAC benefits on a present value basis and under more, most scenarios on, on a pure gross uh, cost basis too. So there's a lot of information on this slide and if you said it was tiny uh, on the screen uh, before, this is even tinier. So, um, but I know you have paper copies in front of you, so uh, please bear with me. We, we modeled six different scenarios. Uh, the first three, scenario one, two, and three, forego the AMBAC uh, benefits. The other three maximize the benefits of the agreement. Um, 
we modeled three repayment uh, scenarios without the, the, the benefits that, uh, you know, under one year, three year and five a year repayment scenarios. The box just below these scenarios show the gross outflows of the combined forbearance debt in the stadium bonds under each of these scenarios. Also included is the present value of these cash flows. Um, I, I, I think most are uh, familiar with the idea of present value, but um, just to review, give the 101, and, you know, the, the present value is a fundamental uh, financial analysis concept that is used in basically every multi-year cash flow comparison. It's the idea that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future because you can invest, invest money today uh, and then earn a return on that money or, or inflation will devalue uh, that, that dollar, making it less valuable in the future. So, you know, but present value is, you know, you know um, a very, um, frankly, basic and fundamental piece of financial analysis. We discounted the cash flows back at the estimated cost of capital of, of financing, um, which is the convention that we usually do in, for funding scenarios. The numbers below those costs, the ones with year end 2021, 2022, and so forth, those are the projected year end fund balance positions under each scenario. These projections are based on those that were th thoroughly reviewed by us all as part of the five-year planning process. We didn't arbitrarily pick these numbers. This is part of the, the five-year plan. So, you know, since we've gone through this exercise, we can overlay these repayment scenarios and see how they play out. Um, we, we did make some adjustments. Um, we, we revised the 2001 projection based on mid-year financial report results and year-end projections. Um, we, of course, incorporated the, the debt service implications of each one of these scenarios in there. If you re repay uh, a debt entirely, then you're obviously not going to have um, that debt service beginning in 2023, or, or when, um, and, and that is reflected in the scenarios. And we also take into account a rolling $2.6 million of encumbrances, which was uh, the level of encumbrances at the beginning of 2021, because we're talking about point in time repayments here and, and uh, frankly near term uh, repayments. So it, I think it's important to uh, take those encumbrances into account. Finally, the last row on the slide shows the fund balance target in the five-year plan. As I mentioned before, two months of operating expenses, about 11.9 million. That's going to go up or down uh, a little bit every year, depending on your expenses. But you know, we all get the point of, of that principle, right? It's going to be about eleven point nine million dollars. So this analysis shows negative fund balance balances at points in all of the first uh, three scenarios, and, and but for maybe early in the repayment schedules for you know, two and three, uh, the in inability to meet the fund balance target. Uh, we, we ran scenario three, the five-year repayment scenario, to see if there was any way to make this work. Uh, by stretching it out longer, and, and there's a still there's still a projected negative in year five. The other three scenarios, four through six, assume the city maximizes the benefit of the AMBEC agreement by year end. Since there obviously won't be any financing between now and December 31st, it's it's just obviously not going to happen. Uh, even if everybody was on board with it, there just simply isn't enough time. Complying and maximizing. Um, the benefits of the agreement would require cash outlay of about $9 million, just under $5 million for the defeasance of the stadium bonds and the $4 million of prepayments to or repayments for the forbearance liability. Scenario four assumes no refinancing. You know, we, we wanted to, to, to show that doing the AMBAC deal results in uh, less cost than foregoing the deal on virtually any scenario. Scenario four assumes that after the stadium bonds are defeased, the forbearance liability is paid down over five years. Uh, paying down the liability over five years under you know, the right side scenario is less expensive on a gross basis 
not even present value. If, you know, you want to argue about discount rates or the relevance of present value, which you know, your present value is obviously relevant. But even if you know you just want to look at it on a gross basis, paying it down over five years is less expensive um, than paying it down on, in one year um, uh, uh, if you forego these benefits. Of course, on scenario four with the five-year plan projections, projections, there's still a liquidity problem, still not meeting the fund balance target. Um, and, and getting really thin in year five. And then that, that is you know, something that uh, definitely needs to be taken into account. So we ran two scenarios, assuming a refinancing of the remaining balance after the cash outlays at the end of this year. Scenario five shows a refinancing under an, the interest rate assumption in the five-year plan. And, and I'll reiterate what was written in the five that this is a very conservative rate. This was used for five-year planning purposes to demonstrate the benefits of a refinancing and even under cons uh, conservative assumptions. This was not meant for the purpose of uh, finalizing a plan of finance. Nevertheless, uh, on a present value basis, it's still less expensive than any of scenarios one, one through three, obviously not the liquidity problems. The last scenario is a lower refinancing rate assumption. But frankly, what, you know, when we went through the RFP process for underwriters, um, you know, we, we asked them to provide indicative interest rate scales. And uh, you know, two were much more aggressive than this rate was, uh, that we're showing even here. So you know, it's, it, um, I, I don't want low interest rate scenario to be interpreted yeah. as best case, because this is not the best case. Um, the reason why we're using some of these higher rates is because there is so, in, so much uncertainty with um, Harrisburg re-entering the debt markets that we were going to always err on the side of being conservative. Um, scenario six is the um, uh, least costly on a present value basis. Um, it, it's less costly on a, on a gross basis too, compared to you know, most of this, um, uh, two of the three scenarios uh, that we modeled out that don't include uh, the AMBAC agreement and obviously should the you know, secure liquidity position. So, you know, we think the plan going forward is basically the approach that's outlined in the five year plan. First, maximize the benefits of the AMBAC agreement, which was a key component of the five-year plan, a key recommendation of Act 47 plans before that. And that involves, as I've said before, defeasing the stadium bonds and making a $4 million repayment by the end of the year. We also recommend taking the necessary steps to sit, put the city in position to refinance the, main, the remaining liability if it chooses. Again, moving forward with the AMBAC agreement does not obligate a refinancing, but of course it's a strong and viable option. The financing process, and this was laid out in the five-year plan too, would involve determining the optimal mix, uh, mix of addressing that forbearance liability with refinancing proceeds and or fund balance to eliminate that forbearance liability and secure taxpayer savings. And that determination will, be, it will depend on the city's ability to maintain target fund balance levels and the economics of the deal itself will be, which will be a function of market conditions, the outcome of the rating process, et cetera. Et cetera. So um, I, I know that's um, uh, quite a bit of information. That was a mouthful for me. Um, I'm the, the following slides are the backup schedules behind uh, the summary data um, on that table full of numbers. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Board members, I'll chime in as well with questions that we may have from your presentation and the documentation. Oh, uh, let me start with uh, just a couple quick questions. If I read the charts at the back correctly, uh, in scenarios five and six, you're talking about. 
uh, a 10 year debt refinancing? That's correct. To match the existing term of the forbearance li liability. Okay, and then there's nothing in the uh, restated settlement agreement that uh, creates any penalty or any other uh, impediment to uh, doing the refinancing. Not at all. And, and in fact, one condition of the settlement agreement is that the city cannot incur other debt, um, but for limited exceptions, as long as that fair baron, forbearance liability is outstanding. Um, since the city wouldn't uh, incur uh, new debt without first addressing this high interest rate debt, that was a, a pretty easy condition for us to uh, agree to. But no, there are no prohibitions. Of course, all these charts assume that the refinancing is accomplished as soon as practicable in 2022. Yes, it, it, we we assumed uh, it, it's executed March fifteenth. Uh, uh, realistically, you know, I, that even if it, it was a, a go right away, that that might be an aggressive timeline. But it is it, it, it doesn't materially change, you know, the economics here if it, it's a month later or two months later or something. Thank you. My basic first question is. How did you come up with the discount rate? Um, the discount rate is the cost of capital on the scenario six, which is uh, the convention for discounting cash flows on a funding analysis and project for funding analysis. That's just different than naive me would have gone about it. I usually do it trade off what I can get for my money. Uh, that would be substantially lower at this point. Um, well, it's, well, for the for the record, um, the you know scenario six is still less expensive on a um, present value basis, even with a, um, a one percent discount rate. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I w was thinking through some of this, and uh, I, I think what you're talking about is the idea of negative care which is um, if you have fund balance and we're, we're saying our target level is 11.9 and you're uh, uh, earning some interest on that, the difference, you know, that, that's really what your uh, opportunity cost is. Um, whether you're talking scenario one, two, three, four, five, or six, I think we're talking about the same fund balance level, right? Um, I, it hasn't been our, I, I, I have not heard any, um, uh, anything from any other quarters that says we, we um, from those who are presenting this alternative strategies, like we should uh, maintain a $5 million fund balance and, and, you know, um, and, and, and lower the fund balance level. So the opportunity cost for all these six scenarios are, are, are the same. Um, I would say that um, any increment above that 11.9, I'm um, more inclined to you know, agree with you that that, that is money that's kind of more a different opportunity cost type analysis there. But if we are de facto $11.9 million fund balance, that's our baseline. That's the same under any scenario, right? Okay. Uh, Dan, I got a question about um, scenarios five and six, where you show the, the fund balance still uh in in projected year 2022 still a little bit below the uh, below the target mm -hmm. and I, under, I guess that's arising because what you're showing here is that in 2021 what you're saying is no matter what that's coming from fund balance 8.98 million just just to meet that just to, to take advantage of that and back deal on the table yes right okay so do you do you think there's a there's like fine tuning of these scenarios that in which you might take you know which you might even propose borrowing more money in order to have a larger fund balance in 2022. Well, I, and this is the uh, this is this is the importance of the five year planning process, right? Is because if you only look two years out and you saw a declining fund balance there, you might be really kind of worried about it. Um, I'm looking at it and thinking we have a, a credible plan where the balance is picking up um, the the next year. So maybe that's um, a good reason to limit the size of the borrowing and knowing that in 2023, we're essentially gonna be at that fund balance target again. Um, it, you know, it, it's, um, 
a, a way to look at it. I think if there's a credible, if, if you're not really going below that level all that much and there's a credible plan to get there in the very near future, uh, I, I think that's justifiable is my sense. Yeah, I, I, I would just remember that when we were having the um, some of the discussions back uh, when you were presenting the five-year plan, one of the things we talked about was, um, you know, you ran the scenarios and, and you said this, this these scenarios are meant to, to include it in the plan, so they're meant to provide options. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, one of your options was to finance 100% of it. And it sounds like that option you're saying is not really on the table right now. So, and we were questioning, one of the questions we came up with was, what if you did use some of the quote unquote excessive fund balance now? Um, so it, you are showing that in this scenario, but- um, that, that is there and, and that was the plan all along. I mean, the, the, we were moving forward with the, where we're trying to get the authorizations to continue on with the process and determine a final plan of finance with the mix of 100% um, debt, 0% fund balance or, or or somewhere in between um, until we get to a, a you know a, a plan that can meet all the targets that were outlined in the five year plan. So un under your scenarios like five and six, like maybe a way to paraphrase this from maybe like using layman's terminology would be that um, you're taking advantage of the deal on the table using existing fund balance, so using existing cash, um, and essentially refinancing the forbearance liability, which is accruing interest at 6.75%. And you're saying basically refinancing that with something new that has an interest rate lower than that of somewhere in the three to 5% range. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, it, it's because we're gonna have a liability that temporarily will have a 5% rate, but um, that's only for three years. And you're gonna, I'm confident that the city can refinance at a rate that's much lower than 5% um, to make this economical and, you know, that then you, we, we revisit the, the five-year plan and ensure that we can uh, meet our, all of our goals and to finalize the plan of finance uh, that fits that model. Um, just a question that's kind of off the chart here, call it maybe scenario seven, if you will. Is there a world in which like the markets go haywire um, and the city still takes advantage of the AMBAC deal using that $9 million payment and then doesn't refinance and just, you know, tries to refinance again in the future when markets normalize, if, if something crazy were to happen between now and end of the year? Sure, I mean, about, yeah, it, it's it, it's modified scenario four, which is just using cash, but stretching it out. And if the world goes haywire before, you know, you have an $8 million um, cash outlay on, on that liability, you, you just carry the, you know, the existing liability a, a, a little bit more. Okay, so even under your modified scenario four, the 2022 projected number would still be a little bit below your target balance. It looks like it would be in the range of 10.6 million. Well, which scenario four? Like the modified scenario four, I'm kind of eyeballing oh, yeah. here to get a sense of what happens if um, yeah. without refinancing, what that looks like. And then in 2023, your fund balance would begin to increase again. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time following. Uh, you, I mean, it, it, um, did you get to this slide? You know, I didn't present the slide, but it's included in there, what the what the scenario for outflows are for each of the first five years. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would just note that, you know, um, you, you can adjust those. There are the, the minimum payments beginning in 2023 are the, um, it's about 3.8 million. So uh, th that will be, you know, something the city, you know, has to make if there's a forbearance debt outstanding. Otherwise, you can um, manage your cash flow or your debt repayment schedule um, as necessary. So there's a minimum of 3.8 in 2023. Uh, it, it, if it if it's outstanding, that will, that's going to be about what the general, but the repayment schedule will be. Doing. I'll ask you a question. I, I assume it's all folded up in your scenarios, and I, I think you've. I assume you've already counted for this because it's in the plan. But could you just confirm that under the um the the the, the 2005 A two series in the five year plan you had a note that there was a debt reserve fund that would then become unencumbered and return to the city. No. That's, that's still true. That, that that's all accounted for. Yeah. 
that's, that's still the case. Yeah, and it's accounted for in scenarios one, two, and three as well. Um, we, we don't include a debt service payment in 2030 for that reason. It, it comes out of the, the, the reserve fund, we'll take that out. Are you able to provide a copy of your um, pro the projections that you did based on the mid-year report? Is that something we could see? Yes. And I, to follow up on that, um, because we all start this from a scenario of what you anticipate the fund balance will be at the end of the year. Uh, and in 2020, you did a projection of where we would end up. This year, that was excluded. I'm not sure why you didn't project where you'd end up. And in 2020, it was $8 million off. So it was $8 million greater at the end of the year. And so when we look at 29 million fund balance, we're sitting on 43 million now. So these scenarios could change significantly in my mind if that fund balance is much greater. In addition, um, you've got American Rescue Plan money, and we don't know how much the city will benefit or is able to benefit recouping funds that they spend, which would then be another addition to the fund balance. So all that to say, I, I mean, these scenarios to me are interesting, but until we can all agree on what the fund balance is, it makes it really hard to like make long-term projections. And it, to me, it was disappointing. My, my scheme was just take the 4 million, pay it off this year because it's been budgeted and then revisit everything once you get a sense. But from what you've said, even that is not possible time-wise. Well, what, what do you mean is not, what, what's yeah, not possible? No, fine. So if we were able to take 4 million and pay down the AMREC debt, much like for the past two years, the city has been grant has budgeted five million dollar pay down with a multiplier, and we never did it. Is that well, a we, we didn't have an enacted agreement for it? That's why we didn't do it. We were we were negotiating towards that, and then last year COVID hit. That's why we didn't do it. And you know, fund balance is like you know, if if you don't believe in present value or you have an issue with the discount rate, if you think the fund, the fund balance projections are junk, it is simply more money to the taxpayer to forego this AMBAC deal. I'm sure there are many discussions that could be had about that. Um, and I'm not sure, if you, have you discussed this with the controller, with Charlie and crew? I have not reviewed these numbers with them. Because I, personally, I'd be grateful for if you would discuss it with them so we can get their reaction on it. And mostly because I'm, if Kathy were here, she and I could sort of touch elbows and say, I'm not a finance person. So it's more gut questions and feelings. Okay, that's good. Oh, yeah. Um, Dan, I just have a couple of questions just for to educate me, um, the $4 million of forbearance payment, is, is, is that, it's been referred to in a couple of different ways. Is that a minimum uh, or, or a suggested or a maximum in terms of the current uh, first step in the settlement agreement? In other words, is there any restriction on the city changing that number in the settlement, let's say higher than $4 million? You can there is no minimum to prepay before the end of the year but prepayments up to four million will get a 38 percent credit against liability there's no restriction on paying more than four million okay. so that's the first question and then it's a similar question assuming the four million dollar payment is made in the calendar year 21 and let's just say that in the beginning of the new year, um, the city determines that it did have a more successful fund balance in, at the end of 21 than it originally thought. Could additional payments, not for the benefit of lowering the interest rate, but additional uh, advanced payments be made against the remaining debt 
prior to refinance in 22. In other words, if they said, oh, listen, we have a windfall of another $4 million in fund balance, mm -hmm. could we, at that point, is there anything in the rules of the settlement that would prohibit them from making an, ad an additional uh, repayment, prepayment towards the balance? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Let me just, in, in the um, existing agreement, there was just, you, you can do it one time a year. There, there, there wasn't, you know, you can do it every year. But I, I, I don't believe that's in this, um, uh, the revised agreement, but let me double check on, on that. But um, yeah, you, 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 we, you, you can make additional repayments afterwards. There might just be a restriction on the frequency that it's allowed, but you can make additional payments. Right. So, uh, and this is completely hypothetical, but it really doesn't change any of your numbers. It's just a, a process question. You can get, for example, you were, you were assuming that a refi uh, at the earliest possible date that that could happen would be March of 22, practically speaking, just to get a refi done. Theoretically, as part of that refi, the city could say, and we're going to make an additional contribution of X number of dollars to first reduce the balance prior to the refi because we've determined we have slightly more available liquid cash to do that. There's nothing to prohibit the mayor and council from making that determination as part of that refi transaction next year. No, they're, they're, yeah, if you can uh, use it, you can use fund balance as an additional source uh, trans transaction to make it part of the financing. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jen. That was my only question. Are there other questions, observations? Uh, just, just an observation, not a, no further question on it right this time, but um, the observation that, you know, it's a, it's a shame to, to know about COVID delaying the settlement the first time it was negotiated around, you know, in, interest accrual at 6.75%, you know, pretty under, under market conditions today, not just for municipal entities, it's, it's a high rate. And given the, given the amount of the forbearance liability, that's a hefty, that's a hefty addition to the tab every year. So every year that this is outstanding seems to seems to be very costly to the taxpayers. You know, at the end of the day, when it's all wrapped up. So, um, uh, Dan, I would I would love to for my comment. I would just love to leave you with um, a politely worded urge to have a sense of urgency in uh, engaging with all interested parties to make sure that you have a, a plan that everyone's signed off on and, and acceptable, so that this can be executed and. And the and that the plan the plan as agreed upon proceeds as fast as possible. Sure, it's uh, and I just well, uh, in the middle of COVID last year, um, cash was king. I'll just leave it at that. I, I think, in fairness, I, uh, part of the COVID issue probably was cash. Such an uncertainty on where where our cash position would be, it's kind of hard to consummate the negotiation in that context. As so, that's I think probably part of it. But I think the other point uh, that you raise is uh, I agree with that uh, we should proceed as quickly as possible to try to get something resolved. And we do have, as I understand it, the hard stop of December thirty first on uh, the restatement. So, and just just so that everybody knows where they're looking. On the agreement, 3.11 3 is the prepayment provision. It provides that they can make a prepayment at any time as long as they make it on the 15th of the month. Okay. So they can make multiple prepayments. Thank multiple. you for clarifying that detail. I was pretty sure that we made yeah, that adjustment in this agreement. Okay. I, 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 the point I was trying to make, and that Anne, we just clarified just for the board's sake, is that I know there's some question about whether or not. You know, the, the talk is that it should, should there be a $4 million prepayment or advanced prepayment, or should there be a much larger uh, prepayment? And the truth is, there's, there's no need to just look at the minimum and the maximum. There can be a variety of decisions, and it can be done as, you per, as the city proceeds fiscally going forward. They can change their mind. They can make the $4 million payment now and revisit the issue in the first quarter of 22 or in the second quarter of 22 and say, well, maybe we should have paid down a little bit more because things are well, or maybe that was a smart decision because things aren't good going so well. So there's no reason to be locked into a number. I understand there's a desire to remove the debt as soon as possible because it's a burden. The interest is a burden. But you can be flexible. They can be flexible. City council can be flexible. The mayor can be flexible. 
of what they believe is the best strategy for the city and continue to make that decision on an ongoing basis going forward, as opposed to making a final decision today. If they have to make a final decision on the December 31st deadline, that's a decision. But then they can continue to, to make this further decisions about the best way to proceed after. So. Dan, for clarification, is it decision by the 31st or, or actual consummation by the 31st? Okay. Consummation. Yeah, we have to have everything de defeased and uh, prepaid by then. But a defeasance does, uh, logistically, does not take a long time. Um, we, we can get it done in 30 days. But um, right now, in, in, the, in the 2021 budget, there is a $2 million allocation of prepayment towards this liability. Um, and and uh, I think there's going to be um, it advanced a, a, a movement or a resolution to allocate an, an additional $2 million to maximize it. Um, and, and so I'm sure you'll have many more discussions because you'll be visiting this subject with city council um, as well as after talking to Charlie. Um, because again, if we have such a large fund balance, to me, it's always good to know what the trade-off is. If we don't prepay, what are we gonna do with that money to benefit the citizens of Harrisburg? And if we're not going to do anything, why wouldn't it make more sense to pay it off? Um, my, my, my first issue is getting these uh, steps done before by December 31st. And as I outlined in the presentation, then the city can step back and reassess exactly what's, what it wants to do with the balance of the uh, forbearance debt. Can I ask a pr procedural question outside of the presentation here to Dan about what the steps are needed to consummate. It looks like we got we got a copy of um, some sort of a court order approving the, the restated settlement agreement with them back. Could you just, could I ask, and if you could, um, if you could indicate what the steps would be in order to consummate this from this point forward? Um, is Neil there? Neil, Neil would be better to talk to him. Sure, it's, um, the order has to be a final
agree to release any money because they didn't know whether we were putting in taxes at all. They didn't know what was going to happen. And the MF is the same way. They, they, everyone was just sort of frozen in place. So that's so we was there ready to go, literally at the last meeting. We thought we would be done that by May at the point. So, so the scenario with this one that was just approved by the court, that's already been approved legislatively, administratively. So right. it's an execution for both parties. It's in part of our five-year plan. So we don't need to do an amendment to the plan since it's allowed for. There's no more books to be had, but for the additional $2 million to reach the $4 million uh, in a reallocation. So the so the full eight point nine eight is not allocated. The, 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 of the of that prepayment, the four million against credit, two million was allocated, and that'll go down in a budget reallocation. Next Tuesday is the next scheduled budget. Reallocation. Thank you. Incidentally, only two million was budgeted instead of four million because council was really um, worried about using too much fund balance. He has a hard stop at that, so he'll be he'll be done. Uh, but and I there's one more that we need to have Dan report on. Um, so we may have to follow up by question because there were a lot of other issues that you were gonna talk to us about, including uh, comments on the mid-year report. I had already indicated one of the things that seemed to be missing was a projection of where you saw the city going based on the fact revenues are slightly over, expenditures, one could say almost significantly under, um, yet no projection was made where, it's, where you find yourselves, which is a pivot point for the fund balance. Sure, but I can provide that. Um, uh, Feedback. I, I, I say I, I did see um, the deputy controller's projections um, from uh, that he shared with council, and he it looks like he took last year's September, last year's October, and so forth, and moved it up to 2021. Then made a couple of adjustments for known increases. Um, I, I, I can't say for certain what the difference is between our numbers and, and that, but I um, suspect it's that. Um, he's not taken into account budgeted and still planned capital expenditures that if they don't happen by the end of the year, will be rolled over into next year. I don't think there's any plans to not do those capital projects. So I, I think that's the main difference between those two sets of projections. Um, but, but again, not sure, but I, we, we can share. Um, Dan, you had a um, we talked. We talked a little bit. Well, I don't I guess we can talk later about that. But the two letters you have promised, the side letters, will be in our hands in time to review in advance of the next board meeting. I mean, this was great information. It's really hard to absorb this kind of information in a day before a meeting when the rest of life has to go on. So it would be great if we could get that more than eight hours in advance of the meeting. Sure. And then, uh, the email that we received from Dan uh, discussed yeah. the report on the FY21 collection efforts and results in the neighborhood services body. So I don't know, Dan, if you're gonna comment on that. Um, I did, my comment is similar to what I wrote in the email, which is, um, yeah, that there's been a letter writing campaign to reach out over social media to delinquent accounts to notify them of their delinquencies and, and, and um, the combination of put pressure slash educate on how to get those payments made. Um, and there was in some initial success at, at first, you know, the mid-year uh, collections would indicate that that's plateaued uh, some. But we also know that this is an initiative that takes some time to implement for sure and see the results of. And we're also working in an environment that is still challenging for a lot of people dealing with COVID related hardships. So um, it, it's this is an issue clearly the city understands it's uh, um, particularly important to the ICA. It's important to the city too. And um, you know, you know, we'll, 
provide periodic updates. It's, it's a tough thing to do on a month to month basis, but we'll keep you. Right. To the end of the third quarter. So, um, you know, it would be uh, great to be able to estimate are you going to be 10% successful, 70% successful? Um, because the first numbers, as you said, were very encouraging. And then you budgeted it, and then for 88%, whatever, or 83, and then up to 88% in 2023. Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, from five year planning purposes, we started um, uh, accounting for improvements in the rates next year. 2021. Clearly, you know, we want to improve the collection rate of citizens. May I? Yeah, please. It, it looks like the update that you that you provided is just a copy and paste from the five year plan. It doesn't look like it's a timely update. No, that's have basically seen, what's. Have you, what, seen what's any, happened. have you seen any financial reports on the, the collection situation with the neighborhood services fund? Uh, this is information that I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I'm not in touch with that operation on a daily basis, so I can't speak to that. Jeffrey, could could you contact whether it's you know Dan, whether Dan's going to assist you or it's somebody else in the city? And I see the city representative here. But if you could, I mean, we're talking about dollar figures, and these are things that which you produce, you know, reports that demonstrate you know, <laughs> days of aging of receivables, dollar amounts of receivables. I think we could get a quantitative report on this and. Um, I would like to. I would like to think that such a report exists because I would like to think that the folks managing the collections efforts monitor collect monitor outstanding receivables. I'll leave it at that. I don't, you know, having nothing but a, a copy and paste from the five-year plan is, I think, I think, in, potentially indicative of the fact that the initiative is is maybe not proceeding as uh, as one hoped. I'll work with Dan. And Thank you. And and I'll just. Echo what I hear as a bit of frustration in Ralph's voice. I mean, we we ask for things, we put them in writing, and yet no one responds. And so now, when we have you here, to then also have you say you can't get these numbers, that makes it really frustrating because there doesn't seem any path forward to get this information. So um, it would be my hope that that you could use your leverage to get answers to the questions in the reports that we would like to see and get them in a timely basis, or at least get members of city staff to respond to us. It, 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 I wanna pile it on here. It, based on the mid-year report, it looks like there has been zero improvement in collections. It looks like through six months, you had a close to 50% collection, which would indi indicate there has been no collection of past due amounts or improvement in collections rate for the current year to date. So like, if there's, if you're sensing aggravation or frustration in my comments or tone of voice, it's because it's there. But Dan might not have access to it. Well, but although he serves as the representative from the city, so someone has to have access and Dan, we truly believe that you have been given that access because you are the person that is to present and keep us in touch with what's going on in the city. And, and if you tell us it's not you, please tell us who, and we will invite that person to participate in the meeting. But again, to try and get people where we're told, no, they can't come talk to you, We'll get you an answer sometime. And it's these vagaries that, again, are so frustrating. Any, um, as far as the other court order, are we going to try and squeeze that in I with think Dan? We try. It was on Dan's email. Okay. So. Sorry. I'm just going to read the bullet from his email. It's a, an update on the conversation with the court relative to existing uh, exiting Act 27, and whether that's Dan or running up against his deadline or, or Neil. I'm sure we can see that goal. Yeah, I'm not sure. I do have to sign off, and maybe Neil is a better person to address that than me. So, um, just so you know, we may be forwarding some questions 
from public comment to you. If, and I'll rely on Jeffrey to make sure that gets to you and work to get the answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. I can only tell you that it's still in progress. Um, court order on the incinerator decision was actually brought uh, back for the order to come to that point. Um, it came out and written in a way that we have to factor in for the agreement. It's a complicated agreement because it's the court was surrendering and retaining jurisdiction at the same time because uh, all of the stakeholders in the receivership agreements wish to have access to the So Spreading that needle has become fairly complicated to say we want the court not to have jurisdiction over these matters, we want to retain jurisdiction for these matters, because we want to be able to not have to take two years to come back to you. That's the negotiation. And it's just a complicated piece. I think that order was written from the city's perspective in a positive, but I don't think it's a problem from the perspective of the positive. The city is able to proceed through the coordinator's office to recover its losses. The governor and the PCB are not able to proceed to recover their expenditures and losses, which were when the city went to the receivership. I don't think the state has made a decision yet on whether they're going to appeal that, they don't know what they're going to do with it. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very long document, it took two years to come out, uh, and it has many people to work. But um, and so, so that has factored in to whether you can, if you misstep, they were concerned that you lose the right to proceed. In that case, that was the concern, um, and, and that's the job. So, um, but we expect to file it this fall. There's a footnote at the beginning of that application portion that was the first of three filings that we intend to make as soon as that goes set. The second one has to do with protecting certain rates that went up, uh, and the last one is the actual exit. So, uh, but, but they are complicated. Uh, trying to not create problems. Just overall, was your reaction to the ruling a positive or a negative one? Mine is positive. So I, I, I've I, litigated for 30 some years. They lost one defendant at level one. And uh, the court was pretty harsh on the on the comments about what the conduct was, but that wasn't the question in front of them. So they could they were just on procedural objections. But you could tell from the tone of it, the court was saying it's not how we're supposed to behave. Um, so we're positive. We hope, you know, we're not in the discussion with the Commonwealth. There, you know, that's been assigned to them. You know, uh, we're hoping that will lead people sitting at the table and having a rational discussion. It would be good to close the chapter. Yeah. When I first read it, it was all despondent. I started reading through it, not really comprehending everything, but kept seeing overruled, overruled. I'm like, ooh. Oh, okay, maybe it's good. Yeah, but there were so many objections, right? That was yes, like so, right. so so you had to sort of get a flow chart to say what was still here. Right. Right. Uh, but I don't know what the comments are going to do. Frankly, they have been picking up the legal path because they had claims. I don't know. They have mixed decisions, and we continue to want to make them um, support the people there. So, you know, we'll really get 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 this on. So don't answer this question if you don't want to. Would the city be willing to invest in continuing picking up the lawsuit? So, so because the time isn't here yet, I, I, I know where my, where my lines are. Okay. That, that is a decision that gets made by a mayor and a council on okay. another day um, about what they want to invest in. Neil, you know, a quick question if I, I want to make sure I understand. Um, we still have this unsigned intergovernmental cooperation agreement that's out there. Do the issues that remain that are important within Commonwealth Court, are they affected by whether or not that agreement gets signed and you are removed, therefore, from Act 47? Or they, they, they if we can much, do they, that, they very much get affected. They're the tied because it's, it's the agreement without a court order first. Creates an exit from Act 47 as a matter of law and yes, divest the court of jurisdiction over Act 47 as a matter of But it law. doesn't divest. If I read that opinion right, they're drawing a the distinction between the strong plan and the Act 47 stuff, so that there are still strong plan events that would continue to exist because they are not subsumed in the Act 47. We're on. We're in the 
very much part of it. There's an agreement the parties voluntarily entered into. All of the parties, all the stakeholders were in agreement. That process uh, that we've adopted is the one that should go forward. And based so on what we have the agreement, the I guess the next that once the court gives the final approval, that no one can argue that the parties intentionally walked away in the West. That's that's the issue. And uh, and we hope to have it this fall. I'm not aware of any objections coming. I know that the Senate has uh, structure. Okay. And then I can stop talking about it. Because that's the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you, Dan. You made it. I think we got a good explanation. And, and Definitely will follow up for us. Um, I have a short chair's report, which is crazy because we're almost an hour, over an hour in. Uh, the month has flown by, uh, and we continue to want to make sure we're on top of the information that we're entitled to. And I think that was part of the frustration for Ralph and me express. Uh, I think one of the things I'd love to know, Jeffrey, is like we have no status on the uh, FY20 audit. Sorry, I'm supposed to make my straight report. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, we did see uh, several positions suddenly filled this year, or this month rather, with a uh, replacement for Blake Lynch, uh, who is now Anna White, and the Director of Economic Development, uh, Auto Banks. And we want to be sure to be back in touch with the mayor to make sure we can get some sense of what, if anything, will happen. Um, Mr. Banks may not be in a position to report anything, but certainly I think we need and deserve an update on the community services division and what sort of uh, performance measures, you know, what results are coming from what was and is a massive infusion in the policing department. Um, so we've got six weeks to the election and it's gonna be anything but quiet and routine and to paraphrase Betty Davis, fasten your seatbelts. It's gonna be a rocky ride. Um, and um, we do try and keep tabs on everything as it does progress, and we were lucky that Jeffrey was available last Tuesday, or two Tuesdays, whatever Tuesday, to listen to a report on the software upgrades that are finally happening within the city as I understand it. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sharing sure. your perspective about that. I'm gonna give out, uh, I have two documents, but I'm gonna give out the shorter document. Good. Because the one the board is that won't need it, so abridge my comments. This is actually uh, a couple of pages from the city software RFK, but I think what it does is it um, gives you a sense of what the city is doing. Uh, I do have a couple of pages from the vendor that was selected as well. Uh, but I won't give that out because that's all public information. So the bottom line is that uh, the uh, city of Harrisburg has selected uh, Tyler Technologies to install in a multi-phase project, new ERP, which is a software term that means enterprise resource something like planning. planning software. It means the whole ball of wax kind of software to run everything for the city. And you will see on those pages that I gave you the outline of all the stuff that the new software will do. And it's like everything. Um, so Tyler Technologies was at the city council meeting and it, the, uh, the contract has been approved uh, by the city council. So it is a, it is a go and it is a multi-year implementation process. Uh, so we learned that. Um, 
the, the one of the questions that let me see if I can find my notes. One of the questions that was asked is is it is, is there going to be a hardware component? I know that was Audrey's question. The answer is no, most of it's in the cloud. So they are going to uh, they don't need a whole lot more hardware to get this done. They will be, however, um, part of the deal is renting cloud server space. Um, Tyler uses uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services as its backbone for its cloud uh, operations. So it is an AWS affiliate, Tyler. Tyler is one of the top three largest municipal software companies in the United States. So it is a well-known uh, entity. I believe they're out of Texas, um, but they are, they are in all 50 states and in uh, dozens and dozens of municipalities, including uh, the city of Lancaster, the city of York, and the city of Reading. Um, in fact, they are just completing a city of York implementation project, multi-year implementation project. So they are well aware of how things work in third-class cities in, in Pennsylvania. Um, the first module, and it comes in modules, so they do it, they phase it in in modules. The modules line up to either functions or departments or both. The first one is financials. So they're gonna start with the replacement of the Pentamation software, which we've heard so much about. They will migrate from Pentamation to Tyler, and they will start with that and uh, hopefully move things like general ledger accounts, payable accounts, receivable. They will um, move next uh, to personnel. That's, but they have many more things to move to after that. So it'll be incremental based on the success of implementation. There will be a large implementation team. Um, Steve from IT is the staff person in charge. There will be a steering committee. That's part of what's in the other document. So a steering committee uh, in the city will be formed, um, which will have representatives of uh, administration, different departments, city council, uh, because there'll be uh, incremental decisions that have to be made constantly as the implementation is done. Shall we do this? Shall we do that? Um, Tyler said, the representative from Tyler said, this, it will not go smoothly. It never goes smoothly. Um, it goes in fits and starts and they're used to that. And that's part of the implementation process. Uh, I will tell you from personal experience, I'm familiar with much of their software. Um, generally how this works for municipalities is that they need to make decisions on adapting policies and procedures inside the municipality to the software. The software doesn't bend completely to the city's operations. The operations of the city sometimes have to bend to the software um, because there's no way you can completely customize software uh, of this nature. And so there'll be all kinds of internal decisions made, you know, things like, purchase orders or check runs or reports. The good news is that at the end of the day, as was made perfectly clear by Tyler, their software does everything that a modern municipality would ever want, including a live interactive reporting for public for boards and commissions such as ours for city council. There'll be dashboards where you can go on and look at today's fund balance or today's receivables or things that we could only dream of at this point. Um, that's what you get on the other side, but what you get is a multi-year process of um, some, somewhat disruption to the organization to get it in there. But, but obviously the city has selected one of the premier companies to do this, and that's a major step forward. There were dollar amounts specifically uh, spoken about. It is an expensive undertaking and it is an annual expense because you pay for the licensing on the software as well as the web servers forever. Um, they did, however, talk that uh, the data formats that they use are not proprietary. Everything is uh, SQL server based. And therefore, if for some reason, 10 years from now, the city wants to go out to RFP and seek uh, some alternate uh, provider, they can get the data back out of the system. They're not married and stuck to, to Tyler forever and ever, although there'll be costs to get the software, the data out as well. But it will be their data and they can get it back out. It's actually a very positive development. Um, it's probably much better than 
the incremental discussions that we had in the past about buying the newer version of Pentamation. Um, it totally gets rid of the AS400 uh, old IBM mainframe once and for all. Uh, the interaction with staff will be completely Windows based. So all the interfaces will appear in, in the Windows format. Um, the treasurer and the controller will be fully live linked to everything as well as administration. So it's it's all possible. Uh, a very big undertaking. It's, it's the only message I can give you. And uh, I have volunteered if I could get on the steering committee or in the room with the steering committee, I'd love to. But ultimately, that's up to the city to decide whether or not I could be in that, that, or that group. But I would love to uh, participate based on years of knowing how these operations run. And maybe I could provide some insight, or if nothing else, I could report back to you what they're discussing as the implementation goes on. So uh, a, a big decision for the city of Harris for moving them uh, into the 21st century. Uh, I'd be happy to either answer questions or bring them back to the city if you have it. No, I, I uh, had an opportunity to go through some of it. It was 170 some pages. But yes, yeah, yes. Uh, I, I like the uh, cloud solution. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives. We won't find ourselves in 20 years saying, "Oh, you're still running COBOL," <laughs> uh, among other things. Uh, I saw there's also some opportunities for uh, customer self-service and things like right. that, bill payment and so on. Uh, I did take a quick look through the uh, narrative on security, both software and physical and all the rest of it. That seemed to be all current standards. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, all times. You just read all the stuff I was going to ask about. The <laughs> it's all in there. was the piece that I was most interested in. And I know the treasurer's office is going to be overly excited, especially this week. They are on the front end of this implementation. Any other questions? Um, Jeffrey, I'll turn it back over to you for an update on the business. Sure. So first, the monthly, uh, you should have bills paid report in front of you. Uh, just a pretty standard month. Uh, we started with a balance of $85,057.34, and we ended the the period was $79,814.02. And I have to, to do a big shout out and a thank you to Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development because I have in my possession uh, our year four funding in total. We have a check from DCED to support our operations for the next year. And I have the check and I have to deposit the check, but that's great. and. Uh, Obviously that's terrific. And so we're fully funded for another fiscal year. And also our audit is about to begin for our year three audit. Remember we follow the uh, state uh, calendar. So it's time to do our look back to last year. And so what I need from you all is a motion second and an approval of uh, proceeding with our auditors ZA, who are ready to hit the road and start going through our last year's transactions. And uh, Kim Stank and I are ready to go and we have a, a document that needs to be signed and I will sign it upon your authorization. And just to talk about the fee, it was left level. Yes, no change. Okay. No change for, for a third time. Yes, sir. Oh, we've got a motion on the table. Second. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Passing. That, that completes my business report. You're welcome. Is there anything else uh, for other business? The only other thing I wanted to just make sure everybody saw was the, the little ditty that I put together at the request of um, DCED uh, um, and Mara. Mara asked for her report. Um, that's the first opportunity for us to do that. That you know, prior we we didn't get a chance to put anything together ourselves. So it's not very big, but basically I, I went through the things that we talked about here today, the, the recent opinion, the AMPAC thing, um, and also reported that Carla, since the last report was which was July, um, Carla has joined us so that we're now at full complement. Um, and that's really the events of the last what three months. Yeah. Um, so that's that's about all I had to say. Um, 
and, and how she chooses to implement that into her report, that's up to her. Uh, but, so that's about all I have to say. Oh, the other question I have while you're here, do we have an official appointee? Oh, uh, the, the question you're referring to Beverly, I think Beverly is the, right. an appointee. Who is the, Who's the official Act 47 controller? Coordinator. 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 I get it right. Do we have an official have an appointee official? yet? No, nothing's official. The department has not taken action yet. Can I make a request? Because I think <laughs> it's relevant to Neil as well that we get one. <laughs> Because I, I think one, the I it's is okay. it they're, okay? They're, they're general counsel that retired on August 30th. Well, I have a call into their council or one of their councils to just then that was one of the questions I, I wanted to find out. Good, because oh, you know, as I read that opinion, the absence of one sort of jumps off your Well, it kind of creates all kinds of problems. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that's all I really have to say. Anything else? That will open it up to public comment. And Jeffrey, I'll ask you to guide that. Okay, well, we have nothing in writing. So we'll, I think we have at least one member of the audience who'd like to ask some questions. So uh, go ahead, Mr. Epstein. Just a couple options. Track Three Mile Island for 38 years, incinerated for 32. So I'm going to preface this by saying there's never been a time when anybody died. And experience with the corporate or governmental has uh, had a smooth institutional transfer of effort. And I've been raising this issue for the last couple of months. I don't know what the outcome of this election is going to be, but there's a lot that needs to be decided in the next 60 to 90 days. And I have a concern, and I'm going to continue to raise that concern about how knowledge of it exists is transferred and how you are treated by the government get documents and how the force and so I've been here for two years. That hasn't changed. So cooperation happens on two levels, information and just making an effort. I'm just raising the concern. And again, I've been with six different owners of Three Mile Island, but we have to begin every ownership at the beginning. I'm hoping that doesn't happen here. So whether it's communicated to Neil or Dan or whomever, I'm a little not optimistic that there's going to be a, a, a smooth transition on the five-year plan we do a five-year plan every year at the school district our budget is 217 million it's a pretty big budget it is never the same as what you project in other words you can be concise but you're not going to be first sight so the question i have for dan and i don't care who you are nobody was prepared for COVID. i get it but at the same time you have different staffing challenges you have different health care challenges anybody who's involved in the big budget knows every three to five years you get hit in the gut with healthcare. So my question is, I don't know what kind of flexibility we're gonna have. A five-year plan is not a static document. You may be planned in year one and then year five be harvested. So what I'm suggesting to you, and it's the same challenge that we have despite our best efforts in the district, there's variables that get introduced. It's a little different from us because we have mandates on special education, pension, whatnot. The other thing that I would point out to the people listening and the questions I get is what's the goal? Is the goal to erase the debt? Is the goal for the city to be self-sustaining? Is the goal to increase your bond rating? It's unclear to the community what the goal is. If you sit on the meeting, it seems like it's erasing the debt. And look, I can't say I'm an innocent here. We are perpetuating our budget through sustained debt. Now we'll say it's because of unfunded mandates, but it's unclear to me and what the goal is, it's clear to me what it should be, that you have a structure, a paradigm that can sustain itself and not fall into the same folly that it did prior. And I would also just want to point out two things that are not going to be necessarily pleasant, depending on the next administration. You guys, in a large part, are dependent on state policy and state dark checks. <clears throat> if somebody would make a decision to embrace charter schools, I know this may seem like a wild tangent, and I think that's possible given some of these developments. There's also potential fallout. I'm saying that as somebody who's heavily involved in public education and state policy. The final point I'll make is this. When I got involved with this was Mount Ashmore. I don't know if anybody was around back then. All right, we had, and when the incinerator was, was built, it was actually state of the art and was replacing the old trash heap out of half where we used to play baseball. I think there were good intentions and then things for whatever reason went awry. My concern is this, as we're talking about consolidating and 
you know, taking care of debt decisions made by others, are the same players allowed back into the game? Am, am I going to be sitting here a year from now and I'm going to be talking to Royal Bank of Canada and James Hasty, Susquehanna Finance? I mean, what I didn't hear, what I heard is some macro ideas of what it could be. What I haven't heard are certain principles who contributed to the situation allowed to get back in the game. So I don't know if Dan or Neil remember once to ask, it's been around for a while, and you guys have done yeoman's work, and the city has done a lot of good heavy lifting also, but it's disappointing to hear the discussion on neighborhood services that I heard today after being at this meeting for two years. It kind of leaves me a bit despondent, I gotta be honest with you. And my reputation is probably not like being a guy, probably more white or rich. I don't know if that's a good hybrid. Uh, white Gandhi, Gandhi uh, uh, but this doesn't work unless everybody buys in. Man. You're not going to impose a solution unless, unless we all buy in. And I got to tell you, after two years, still not seeing it. That, and that's all I have. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, I have a question, and then maybe a comment. Uh, does anybody think that the city of does this just mean that the court is approving the uh, agreement between the city and AMBAC? Or yes, that, that, is. They, that the agreement was one of the exhibits, and uh, asked for the resolution to count, and the court had approved the prior AMBAC agreement. So this is a modification. So that is what it is. So the parties are able. They couldn't just have the agreement because the court was involved in the prior agreement. They couldn't just walk away from it because the court ordered it. That's what why it is. But it doesn't it doesn't coerce the parties to do I don't know what that means in a sense. But I, 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 I'm going to walk around City Hall and say we have a court order that says this agreement that you voted to approve, that you initiated this together with it, and you were all obligated to sign it. And that's my advice to my clients. Okay, so I mean that's that's right. a, that, I think what you're asking is is it going to force the city to spend the money to do anything. No, what it does force is what Neil's saying. It's forcing people to sign it. No, that's which is, but I mean, is, is it going to force uh, the city to sign off on this agreement? Yeah. Yes. But I thought that was, it just gives you the ability to negotiate. It doesn't but mandate the, the this. agreement itself has to be signed. Right. So they don't have to. Right. Just, yeah. and I think that's the question. It does not mandate that this is the solution. They have to sign the agreement, yeah, however. Right. That, that is what I'm asking. The reason I'm asking that is because that is what I don't know. I think you guys danced around this a little bit. The problem, from my point of view, with the impact situation, it's not, a, it's not really a financial problem. It's a political problem. And currently, you have two parties, city council generally, the administration, who are not talking to each other, who assume bad will on, on one another, and who are refusing, essentially, to reach an agreement on what to do. And I don't know how that's resolved. And I certainly don't know how this resolved by December 31st or at some point before that, um, so that that agreement can take effect by so the agreement will take effect in October. It's not necessarily not quite. Otherwise, people will be in a court. So the agreement well, that's what I was asking. Right. So the agreement is approved by the court. And the court will take the court. And but the reality is this is I, I, I'm the liaison between those two people who I talk to each other. And uh, what this really does is I think that was already been voted a few times and that's not a kind of new issue. That's different than the finance. It's really a different discussion. Right. How do you do the financing? This gives me an opportunity without the document dictating which method the state works. But what happens right now is there's a budget that most of the money is for the short term for the defeasance and for the getting the discount for the bank is already allocated. The next part will go to I I see city council as trying to do the right thing, I see the mayor is trying to do the right thing. I see them. You know, I, I think they, they're all elected and they start out in public service in practical ways. And they have to go through so I don't I don't anticipate that lower they get up uh, to the taxpayers for the Well I think that from 
my perspective, this document is not for our benefit. It's a good document to use this attempt to really address city council clearly with the options that are out there. So I think they were the primary purpose that this was created for. And so Dan will be giving this similar presentation. The request was made for this week's Tuesday's meeting, and, it, and they wanted the council, the president, and the council's budget chair was not going to be there. So I, I spoke to Linda and Claire, except when it was Tuesday, but you know, I, I expect them to make a presentation. I'd also like to point out that now that Mr. Connolly has presented this PowerPoint to this group, it's a public document, it will be on our website. And the video of his presentation will be on YouTube. So someone could watch it, not interact, but it's it's all public information as of tonight. So any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Comments? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Sorry, just a comment. Uh, so, so Mr. Epstein, I noticed the comments slash questions that you had, and I just wanted to maybe point you in the right direction on maybe where it'd be helpful on a few of them. Sure. Um, regarding the five-year plan that one of your comments addressed, um, the five-year plan is a document that is actually a statutory requirement under Act 124. And um, it's, it's my, I'm not sure how the school districts, but it didn't sound asimilar. This, the city is obligated that to, to represent every year uh, mm -hmm. uh, a five-year plan. And sometimes they'll sort of simply say the same, you know, has changed, or in our case, it actually has every year in a, in a revised plan that's been submitted. Um, the Act 124 does describe how it's how it's approved and how it's administered and if it needs to be amended or revised. So, um, and I and you, knowing who the listener, my comment is, I imagine that's probably good enough where you know how to look up Act 124. And you'll get more reading it than I to paraphrase, although that might not be true. Some of the other folks here might paraphrase it better than better than it describes itself. And the other comment you made about what is what is the goal of some of these. Financing maneuvers and you know why is it here at the ICA board meeting? I assume the implication there, and, and the, the overall mission of the ICA is to assist Harrisburg in achieving financial stability. Um, the, the mission is it's a statutory mission. It's given to us by um, by the, the, the legislative act that created the ICA. So, so the, the goal is generally financial stability. Obviously, um, you know reducing the city's debt burden, help and helping it to re-enter capital markets are are, are noble endeavors, and actually to to have the ability, whether or not they choose to, but have the ability to access capital markets is one of the goals of um, Act 124. So, uh, you know, that's the specific. Opposed, that, that's opposed to what Dan was saying about the re entering the bond market. Yeah, so the ability to access capital markets is a, having the ability to access them is absolutely a, you know, a positive thing. It's actually specifically, um, uh, it's, a, it's a specific goal uh, that Act 124 sets forth. For cities like Harrisburg, maybe might have been in the past locked out of um, access to uh, the capital markets. So, um, sort of summary response, but if you wanted to see more about that, you could actually, someone like you could probably look directly at the law and, and you probably, right. you know, be able, knowing your knowledge about school districts, you might be able to infer more from that. Is that, hopefully, that's helpful to point you in the direction of some of your, from your questions? This is civil after two meetings with master. <laughs> All right, let's see. So, Thank you. I, you know, that's perfect. Um, I was asking for a motion to so adjourn. adjourn. So, I haven't made a motion yet, so I'll make that one. Great. Second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we're all in favor. So, meeting adjourned. All right. See you, see you next month, everyone. Yes.